This is Tommy Chong, man, and this is Wake and Bake with Captain Hooters. It's Captain Hooters. <laughs> Hello. Good everybody. Hooter here, coming to you high and alive and in a wondrous land. How'd you like to hang out in this spot for a while? This is pretty trippy. But listen, I wanted to tell you, I've got something very, very special today. One of those once-in-a-lifetime scenarios. We are going to talk to Tommy Chong. Chief Chin Chong, Tommy Chong. Dude, I'm not even gonna mess around. I'm in a glorious place here. And now, we get to talk to Tommy Chong. Check it out. Hola, hola everyone. Captain Hooter here. Once again, very high, very alive. I'm here with the master. Oh my God, yeah. Tommy Chong. How are you, sir? I'm fine. I'm fine. I just watched a, 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 a little segment of a, of a podcast I did yesterday. <laughs> and I, I am, you can see my age, man. It's <laughs> Dude, you look great. You know, the last time I saw you uh, was in Victoria, BC, Canada. And it yeah. was when you were on tour with your book, with the I Chong. And yeah. I brought you a joint this big uh -huh. that I had rolled from one of the big bamboo uh, papers. Oh, from, from, yeah. yeah. And I didn't know you were on parole and that you are probation or whatever, and you couldn't smoke it. Oh, my God. I couldn't believe it. it I, I started thinking about that, though, when I was going to talk to you now. How much weed did you have to turn down while you were on that book tour? Every day. In jail, in jail. Now listen, I'm in jail, and every day I would be approached because what happened? Uh, the uh, the government, you know, they knew how bogus the, the the charge was. So their their plan was to get me in there and then catch me smoking, yeah. you know, uh, get, uh, do a dirty drug test, and then yeah, we see, you know, blah blah blah, you know, that whole thing. I quit. I literally quit everything. For for over uh, about three years, three years, and I had no problem with it because that's that's the magical thing about this plan, is that uh, it will accommodate you. Period. You know, <laughs> if you're uh, whatever, it, it is such a, a genius plan that I had no physical urge whatsoever. In fact. I was proud of the fact that I never uh, got busted. I, ne I never had a weed. But you know what I, I did? We had a, a herbalist, uh, a gene, uh, what do you call it? We had a sweat lodge in, in the prison. Mm -hmm. And uh, David, God, uh, David uh, Chicano, a Chicano guy. He was like the head of the, the garden. He was okay. the, the herbal master. Well, he told me about this plant called uh, lion's ear, and it's a, a flowering plant, grows quite high, and they use them for hedges a lot. <clears throat> and uh, he told me that if you take the leaf of the lion's ear plant, dry it up in the microwave, and then crumble it up and smoke it, it, it will give you a, a, a nice, nice high. So which, which, which we did. And and it never, there's no trace of uh, THC. So oh. it passed all the drug tests. So I, I everyone, I know not a lot, but uh, a couple of times I had my little uh, uh, lion's ear joint. I'd go smoke it. And then I would have 
what I call other people's dreams. I would have a dream where, wow, I've never seen this dream before. <laughs> it oh, was yeah. like incredible. You must have been smoking a tremendous amount before you went in. So you're, I mean, did you have for an the, For the, yeah, yeah. Not, well, just like now, you know, because we're in the cannabis business, you know, and I got more cannabis than, than I can give away, literally. Right, yeah. And so I, uh, you know, I, 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 I just love the, the process or the, the uh, ritual yeah. of cleaning, cleaning. And, and now, before it used to be cleaning and the stems and seeds and everything, but now it's, it's grinding. <laughs> I use that as a, as a workout. I, I grind my weed. And when, when I got time, I grind my weed and I make joints. I, I, I roll these joints. I, I just started uh, uh, rolling uh, these, these size joints. And uh, these are the Tommy Chong papers. Oh, dude. Okay, so that was one of my questions I was going to ask you now. Is that your main form of consumption, rolling joints? Are you, are you doing any pipes or dabs or... You know, I've got, I, I, I love these here pipe, this pipe here. It was invented by an Israeli uh, in the aer aeronautic business. Uh, but what it is, it's, a, um, it's, it's done, put together by, with magnets. And, and so what they've done here, here if I can get it apart, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little, little. Uh, that shows you it's working. <laughs> and, anyway, it comes apart and, and there's uh, little nipples. And okay. so what happens when you light, when you light it here, yeah. the smoke cools. <laughs> it's what they use in airplanes to cool uh, engine parts or places where there's a lot of heat uh -huh. and and I so like what that. happens with with this pipe here uh it cools the smoke by the time it gets to to you mm -hmm. it, it, it's cooled and so uh -huh. there's not a lot of coughing and everything goes on and it goes to the cooling like, nipples it goes to the cooling yeah. nipples okay yeah the nipples the nipples yeah. cooler the smoke yeah <laughs> I and, love and it. this one this one's got has it got my face on it yeah i think it does <laughs> you're yeah. so resilient of these <laughs> oh yeah I uh, yeah i got those you know because the, you know because who i am i get a lot of things this is what i've been making lately these are um like little joint holders Where, where's the joints the, this year they're the little carving you see it? Oh, there you go there you, okay oh cool Okay. This is a this is a deer antler. Yeah. And so what, what I do with these here, what I found out this here, just by accident, you know, I had the joint in here. Oh. oh. And the great thing, <laughs> you, you set it down, you know, yeah. and it goes out by itself, you know, and, and, I love and it. so you don't waste weed, and, and yet you don't have to deal with it, you know, all the the things. This way you smoke it. This here. This here I call these are not a pipes. And, I and love what those. they are. You've had that for a long time, right? Oh yeah. 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 I, I started carving these. Actually, I got the idea from Cheech. Cheech years ago, Cheech wore a little fish around his neck. Mm -hmm. And and I always admired it. And then uh, when I had a chance, I I started carving these. Well, what I did, I started making these uh smoke uh cigarette holders or joint holders mm -hmm. you know out of antlers mm -hmm. and and then i put one around my neck and oh great and so i use these to, did you start to, doing again, that up in canada hmm? did you start carving the antler things up in 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 canada uh no i just, did just recently it, oh really i had oh, so. a friend i had this real crazy friend louis louis b marvin the third he was called <laughs> and, and louis b marvin the third was this great uh, uh entrepreneur rich guy he, yeah. he had a chance to buy the, the most uh, uh famous um uh the most expensive house in beverly hills 
This was in the 50s. Okay. And, but instead, he bought 10 acres in Malibu. And it was <laughs> up, up on the mountains. Tough choice. And, and then he put farm uh, buildings. He, he bypassed the building code people. Mm -hmm. and, and what they put, like, you can get a, put barns and sheds and everything else without the building inspectors coming, you know, the water and sewer and all that stuff. <clears throat> and so he was a friend of mine, had this 10 acres. And then what he would do, he would, he was so eccentric, Jewish guy. Mm -hmm. He went and bought this church, this historical church uh, that these nuns grew up somewhere in Pennsylvania was mm -hmm. going to, uh, be re relocated mm -hmm. and so the whole church was up for sale and so he bought a, a lot of the church and shipped it to malibu and reconstructed the, the with the stained glass windows and the marble floors and everything else uh and then he was like a full-on uh new york jewish uh guy entrepreneur yeah. he made his fortunes by copying perfumes bootleg perfumes big business and he was yeah he would sell the perfumes to sororities and you know universities at a discount and he made the, he made quite a bit of money millions and then he got in the stock market and he, interesting guy so i met him and he didn't believe in television and so he raised his family just on radio and our 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 records were, were in his wheelhouse, you know, it was okay to listen to Cheech and John records. Yeah. So his whole family, they're little kids. I, I've known them this 20 years. I've known them for like 20 some odd years. Yeah. They're all grown. But when they were little kids, the only thing they ever listened to was Cheech and John records. <laughs> and so when he met me, it was like me, meeting uh, Mickey Mouse uh, of uh, Disneyland, you know? <laughs> so anyway, he... Uh, him and I became really good friends and then he would have parties and he would have all these famous rock stars and musicians come to his parties and that's where I met George Harrison of the Beatles mm -hmm. and so George and I became friends at Louis, Louis B. Marvin's house in Malibu and we yeah. smoked up quite a few times there and uh, it was it was a nice it was a throwback from the 60s you know you know, it's funny because you, you, you know, you, you're going back in time here, and and you know, my very first live concert that I ever saw was in 1972 at the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. The yeah. opening act was Seals and Crofts. Yeah. And the main act that day was Cheech and Chong. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys, you guys was my, that was my very first live concert, and you started wow. the concert. Uh, you were you were on your hands and knees. You did Herbie and Ralph to yeah. open the show. The entire arena had to stand up to watch your first opening set. <laughs> it was fucking brilliant, dude. Was was Herbie and Ralph the first thing you guys really created? What was that? Was that the first gel? It was, yeah, for sure. It was our really to go. It was before we discovered the Chicano power. Mm -hmm. You know, we, I met Cheech up in Canada. And, and uh, so what I did, I used to come down from Canada, come down to LA because my first wife uh, was living in, in LA. Mm -hmm. And so I'd come to visit her and then I'd go back up to Canada to work in the clubs. Uh, while I was in LA, there was a, a improv group called the committee. And the committee, one of the bits they did was where they all got on their hands and knees and they acted like little dogs. <laughs> And it was so funny. I was on the floor uh, screaming. It was so funny because you had all these people doing little doggy things. And so I went up to Canada where I had my own uh, improv club going in a, in a strip club. Yeah. And, uh, and I showed everybody. And then when Cheech and I went off on her own, that was our, uh, our, our closer. That was our screamer. Yeah. The, the bit. It, it was memorable. Yeah. So, so here's my other question. You made a very crucial life decision right then at that time when you broke yeah. off with Cheech. You were a fucking one of, you were in one of the most envious positions. You were on the charts as a recording artist with a, yeah. a real band. 
you had freaking Michael Jackson and the Jacksons opening for you. How was Michael Jackson as a little kid? Was he cool? He was a genius. He was a genius. Could you tell right away, even then? Oh, for sure. What happened? I was in, I wasn't with Cheech then. You know, I was in yeah. a in a in a rhythm and blues band uh, called uh, Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's, mm -hmm. and uh, and we were in Chicago, and the opening act won a contest. Jackson Five won a contest. Uh, you know, at their high school, and so the prize was they got to open for. Uh, Bobby Taylor in the Vancouver's and, and Jerry Butler. And wow. sure enough, uh, first time we saw Michael Jackson, he was about eight, nine years old, tiny. He was very small for his age. All the boys were tall, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Michael, but he had a voice and could dance. like you. The weird thing about Michael was that he was a little man when he was eight, nine years old. Wow. He dressed like a man, act like a like a grown adult. Mm -hmm. The older he got, the younger he got. <laughs> wow. When he was eight, when he was nine and ten years old, he was he wore suits, ties, a little hat. He acted just like a, an adult. And then as he got older, well, he got never never land, you know, because he never. I, I we we seen him. He yeah. was performing all his life on stage. His childhood was really on stage, backstage, yeah. on stage, backstage, his hotel, back on the road. Yeah. That was his life. And so <laughs> when he when he got rich, he became then he, then he had his childhood over again. Yeah. And that's why he never had childhood friends when he was a kid. He never had that. And yeah. and so as he got older, then he got the little guys who would chum around with him because. That, that that's what he missed yeah well he missed he missed that part of his life mm -hmm. but how how hard okay so right there at that time frame you were at a real crossroads i'm still trying to figure out i mean you had material with cheech and you could go on the road and what, what was there a drugs woman what was it that was pulling you extra to go the cheech direction rather than the established i'm already a rock guitarist. I'm I got gonna... fired. Yeah, I, I got, <laughs> literally got fired. I didn't know that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh yeah. No, no. See, <laughs> what made me, what, what made me such a, what which what made me break today, is my ability. See, I started out. I never started out as a guitar player. Mm -hmm. I started out my life. I was about Michael Jackson's age when my neighbor across the, the field who played fiddle uh, knew that I could play a little guitar. Mm -hmm. And and so when his fiddle, when his guitar player got a better job or got a job, <laughs> he needed a, a backup guitar player to play just on the weekends, you know? And so he, uh, he recruited me as a guitar player, a backup guitar player. Mm -hmm. And so on my whole career, started off by backing up another singer or another player and so i never i never had the uh, ambition i never even thought dreamt that i could play guitar i mean as a as a, a, a forest you know in fact it was i i never really looked at guitar players and say oh i want to do that okay. <laughs> until until I got to the point where, wow, I'm at that level. You know, I mean, I like one time I had a, w see with, with us, when I started the band, my mind, my aim was always kind of combating racism mm -hmm. because I was born half Chinese and uh, eight percent native i didn't know that it's so funny because my parents my mom married a Ch full chinese short little guy uh my dad yeah. and that was and then they had the kids that had us and that was our burden and so my mother never hid the fact that we were also native hid that fact okay because it was bad enough just being uh and so my whole life i was always 
subjected to being stared at and being talked about and being pointed out, you know, oh, that's, they're, they're, you know, they're not white, they're Chinese, you know, <clears throat> and, and so my mother told me, she was my mentor kind of thing, you know, I was separated from her early in her, our life because she had TB, and so she right. was quarantined, so I know all about quarantine, you right. know, yeah. and I never really hugged my mother until I was eight, eight, nine, ten years old, oh. <clears throat> And so, yeah. and even then I couldn't hug her because she was recovering. Mm -hmm. uh, but she always told me, she, we, we were a very verbal family because it was storytelling time. With yeah, the, with the that's cool. Yeah. yeah, it was no television, no teachers, no nothing. I never, I was late going to school. And yeah. so I was always a year behind kids and then I, I dropped out one year and then I was really, really, really behind the in class. But my whole life, I was avail I was subjected to racism and on different, like when I was a little kid, I remember we moved into a new neighborhood and, uh, and they had a, the neighborhood had a block party and they're going, and I was pointedly not invited. Mm. because the party was for the the, the guy's daughter mm -hmm. and he didn't want he just wanted white kids is this know. up in edmonton this is edmonton canada this is in calgary calgary okay calgary calgary is one of the racist cities in, 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 on the planet wow. because it's cowboys you know and and what they did it's surrounded by natives by the way but mm -hmm. a, a lot of the natives they grew up with that mindset too you know <laughs> you know <laughs> that 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 kind of a racist attitude right uh in in some respects you know uh so the whole idea of if you were brown it was like and, and you couldn't disguise it in any way then then you were you know you were less than and so right. my whole life i always was aware of this racism and so when i started playing music backing up the the one singer that i backed up he uh he was full-blooded native and and he became an elvis impersonator and so <laughs> and so that made us very popular so i got a flash of that popularity that elvis had so i always knew that feeling of the girls screaming and all that you know and, and what it would what it took but long story short i just every, even the first band that i started we call their so i called it i named the the shades because we were the different colors oh, we I had a, we had rare medium and well done we <laughs> had myself, we had, i have chinese a full-blooded native uh, indian and then a descendant from the black uh, african slaves and like so that was the, flag. yeah that's why we called uh, <laughs> called ourselves the shades that's and awesome. then as we progressed and and the first song that got us in onto motown I wrote it. It was called Does Your Mama Know About Me? Yes. In other words, do you, does she know that I'm I'm not a white guy? You know, I'm a, I'm I'm black, I'm Chinese, I'm brown, I'm something, mm -hmm. I'm different, I'm gay, you know what I mean? I'm 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 not does your mama know what I am? How did you and, meet Barry so, Gordy? Well, that's why, because we were playing in Vancouver at my my after hours club. Diana Ross, and then we became the club that yeah, everybody went to after hours. And so all the Motown acts that would come through uh, Vancouver, after, after their show, they would end up in our show, oh. at, at our club. And so uh, we were there, and we had this incredible singer named Bobby Taylor. And mm -hmm. Bobby is a legend all around America. And, uh, and Diana Ross and the Supremes, they came, they, they heard us, and Diana Ross got a hold of Barry Gordy and, and called him up. Of course, she was having a little affair with him, you know. Yeah. And, and so she, uh, <laughs> so, so Barry went up for a booty call and to, to meet the Vancouvers, which he named us. Did, wasn't Tina Turner also, didn't did she get started up there with you? Well, what happened, when we were trying to make it as a band, the singer, Tommy Milton, he was should have been a star football player, but he hurt his knee. He had that star 
quality. And so he was always on the looking for places where we could perform at, play, mm -hmm. you know. And we found out that we could rent halls real easy and put on our own shows. And so then we found a dance hall that was uh, a rec uh, uh, was a movie theater and they turned it into a dance hall. And back in Canada, it was uh, like the Polish hall, the Italian hall, uh, ethnic. Uh, you yeah. would have the ethnic people would get their halls and, and that's what we'd rent it off of. And so we found this movie theater that was empty. It was uh, had a dance floor. And so we wanted to open it big. And so what we, we called it, I named it the Blues Palace. Mm. It was uh, like, it looked like a palace and, and it was all about blues. <laughs> and so we went to Seattle and we hooked up with a, a promoter that, booked Ike and Tina Turner who were you know coming up doing the road and so they offered us Ike and Tina Turner for $750 and for the Ike and Tina Turner review Ike and Tina and the, and the, and the Icats and <laughs> yeah and so that's how we we opened our, our show with it we were so successful first thing I did I I, I quit my day job <laughs> but I had no clue you know it was a one-time affair had I had a, a string of Tina of uh, uh, appearances which I should have done but I never did anyway uh, uh, we were said so successful again we got kicked out of Calgary literally see my racist view oh. I realized in Calgary, I got in trouble when I was 16 years old. Uh, it was called, the charge was called joyriding. <laughs> what happened in Calgary uh, would steal a car. Some guy, some guy, poor guy would be up warming his car up and some idiot kid would come along and then jump in it and take it for a joyride. And, and so that's what happened to me. I got caught uh, with my friend. Uh, we went to court. And then I realized, you know, that there was really nothing for teenagers to do. And so I, uh, I, I had a meeting with the magistrate that sentenced me, uh, you know, just impromptu. I just went and knocked on his door, come in, talk to him. And I told him there's not much for kids to do, uh, teenagers to do in, in Calgary. And so he told me, he said, well, then get something going. And so I said, oh, good idea. So we started our own teen club. It was called the Shades Teen Club. <laughs> and when you start organizations like that, other organizations give you stuff. Yeah. Like the Legion Hall give us their hall, uh, their dance hall in the middle of Calgary. And we started throwing dances uh, on a Saturday night and so successful. We had people coming, driving three, 400 miles just to go to the, the, the dance. But the problem is that we brought all these thugs and all these uh, teenagers together and then they had nothing to do after the, the dance ended. And so the mayor of Calgary called us into his office and kicked us out of town. <laughs> <laughs> so those were, your, those were your first audiences really? Yeah, so wow. I, 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 I got fired. Like you said, what happened? I got fired and I got fired from Motown because uh, I, I, I had Barry Gordy getting me a green card. And, the, mm -hmm. and, the, and at that time they had Bobby Taylor separate, you know, on his own career. And I was part of a band backing up one of Barry Gordy's girlfriends. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and Barry liked me so much that I had a job there for life, you know, yeah. but the, but the, 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 uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, the the road manager had a different view and he treated me just like a, a guitar player not not a lead guitar player either it was just like mm -hmm. I, I would really wasn't necessary for the gig <laughs> and so so he told me that if I missed the gig I would be fired but I had to get a green card so I missed the gig and I got fired and and that prompted me to uh, stay fired and I and Barry Gordy called me up right away he's oh you're not fired it's been a mistake I said no I'm going to stay fired. 
I told Barry, I said, I want to become a Barry Gordy. I don't want to just work for one. Yes. And Barry says, Barry says, I can respect that. Gave me a nice little severance pay. And that started my uh, career toward uh, finding Cheech and then, and then making history. Dude, and Barry Gordy wishes he was as much of an entrepreneur as you are, dude. You are impressive <laughs> as fuck. No, seriously. Well, I, mean, I learned... I, I learned what I learned off Barry. I, I learned so much off Barry Gordy and Lou Adler, you know, everybody that I connected with because it, it was serendipity. You know, it was uh, like I, I did another podcast yesterday and, and we talked about uh, the power of, of, of cannabis, you know, and why cannabis is such a, you know, it was a deemed essential during the shutdown, you know, because it is a medicine. It, it's way beyond, you know, getting a high or, and, and by the way, it is a gateway drug. You know, remember they used to call it a gateway drug? And they go, oh, no, you know, it is, it mm -hmm. is. Because you don't get the kick that heroin gives you with, with pot. You don't get the, the death either, mm -hmm. you know. That, that, that leads me into one of my other questions perfectly. Okay, so going in, I'm going to go back in time. We're going to go, ooh, doo, 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 back in time, right? In, if you go back into the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, okay? And I'm imagining Tommy Chong during this time. So your level of what's possible might be different than what other people's things of what possible is. Okay, during that time, let's go 60s, 70s, 80s. What was outside of weed, what was the most amazing drug was it Quaaludes, the 714s, the real ones, the Reds, Reds, acid, liquid acid, or some sheet acid that you had at some point, the original ecstasy, something else that we never heard all of? of that, right? All of that, it was more, more than anything, the one that everybody liked, I was never really a big fan of it, was cocaine. Yeah. You know, well. I was never a big fan of cocaine. I, I didn't like the paranoia that came with it you know i i'd rather smoke a joint because the joint my mind explodes with with possibilities you know with cocaine my mind would just go i would feel too satisfied like one time we did cheech and i <laughs> cheech and i went to new york first time in new york and of course right away we we started hanging with uh, with john belushi and, and oh. And they were all big, uh, big fans of Cheech and Chong, you know, because yeah. of the records. And, uh, and of course, right away, there's tons of cocaine. And that's what you do. And everybody's coking out. And so then we performed at the bitter end oh. and did probably the worst show that we've ever done. Wow. Because we, we just came from LA. We thought that we were that everybody from LA was in the crowd. And we forgot that New York is the opposite of LA. They mm -hmm. hate people with confidence. <laughs> you, you know, you gotta be neurotic in order to survive in New York. And, and because everybody's neurotic there. <laughs> and Chichi and I walked out there and bombed, literally bombed <laughs> to the point where they did not like us. <laughs> and they did it on purpose, like Andrew Dice Clay crowd, you know, that sort of, yeah, show me, come on, man, you're from yeah. New Jersey, I'm from New Jersey, well, you know, what, what, what do you got, what do you got, is that it, nah. you know, <laughs> and so cocaine, uh, I, I, I enjoyed Quaaludes, I used to get them from my dentist, uh, nice, <laughs> I had what a, a great source, Perfect. well, yeah, well, I had to give them half, <laughs> you know, but but he gave me the the script, and, and he, in fact, he'd got it for me, and and so I split it with him. Uh but you know, I first of all, I was with the most gorgeous, still am with the most gorgeous lady on the planet, so I didn't need any sex aid. You yes. know, I didn't need any help <laughs> in that area. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in yeah. fact, it was the opposite. If anything, you know, you get the hose out. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and and no, I tell you, you know what saved me? It saved Cheech too. Mm -hmm. uh, our physical, our working out, yeah, weightlifting, weightlifting. 
because I, I when I when I got in, the only thing I could afford in in, in California before I met Cheech, uh, I made sure that I I, I had a, a, a membership to the World's Gym or Gold's Gym, and and that's all I needed because when I went to California, I just needed a place where I could work out, and then the beach is free, and then we lived in a little little place close to the beach. And, uh, and that was it. We had a little baby and, and all I did was uh, either perform, you know, uh, and work out. Uh, and so that was my drug, uh, was living healthy mm-hmm. and working out. Pot, if you had it, I'd smoke it. Uh, <laughs> if, if someone offered me some, I'd do a little bit. But my one thing that I did, and, and I still do to this day, is work out. Because that natural rush is the best high you can get, you know, that pump, that, and knowing, like, like now, uh, a, year, uh, a couple of months ago, I was feeling shortness of breath and all that. And so I was a little worried, so I cut down, cut back on my cardio, and, uh, and, and uh, then I went and did a stress test. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And, and the stress test found out that I needed to do more cardio. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Perfect. It's, yeah. And so now I, I do every day, twice a day, I go, there's a hill around my house and I, I, I go up the hill. But uh, living healthy, I, I found out, is, is, is really the best high you can, you can have. You know, waking up in the morning and... and and not have any, you know, those kind of aches and pains that'll keep you in bed or, or, and not feeling hungover, you know. Mm-hmm. I quit drinking in 05. I, I wasn't a big drinker at all. I started to become one when I, when I went uh, solo with comedy. And I started, uh, I, if there wasn't any booze, I'd go to the, the mini bar. Oh. And, and they had these little champagne mm-hmm. things. And I started, first of all, it was just taking a couple of sips. And then it was like the whole bottle. Then it was like the whole, a couple of bottles, you know, yeah. and I could feel it. I said, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. So I put that, I, I cut that out, just went for just weed where I could smoke it. And then if I, and if there's places where they didn't want you to smoke, I just never smoked. You know? yeah. No problem. You, you know, I just had an interview uh, yesterday with uh, Dan Hare. The son of Jack Harris. Oh, the son of Jack. Yes, yeah. and and uh, he spoke about you obviously very honorably and said that you guys were friends. And I saw posters, a picture posters of you, the two of you together. Do you have any any Jack Harris stories, or can you can you talk a little bit about him? I love Jack. Jack called me up when California went legal medically. Mm-hmm. He called me on the phone. He's okay. Let's go get our cards. You know, and I said, oh, where do you get them? He says, we make them. <laughs> and I said, how do we do that? He goes, come on. He says, we'll go to the doctor. we get a letter. And then he shrunk the letter down to a card size. <laughs> and then we had our own marijuana cards. And when I got busted for bongs, I showed him my card and they laughed at me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <The> no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> they, they chuckled. <laughs> But then, uh, and Jack, that was Jack, because yeah. uh, we'd, we'd been at a few events, and we, we just backstage friends more than anything, you know. Uh, yeah. But he just admired what, what I'd done, and, and I definitely admired him. And, and we co-hosted a few things, uh, you know. And, and the saddest thing is when he got a stroke, yeah. and he couldn't yeah. talk. Yeah. He couldn't talk. Well... It's like having an Italian try to talk with their hands tied behind their back, you know. Jack, the saddest thing was, that, and he would grunt, he would make those sounds, but uh, he'd try. Mm. But oh, it was so, he was trapped. He was trapped, and, and kind of when he passed away, I was like, oh, he's free now, yeah. you know, because he'll be back. He's and he lives on forever now, and and all of the words and all the stuff that he wrote about is all the stuff that's coming true now. And and now they're starting to make all those 
all those conversion. It's so cool. You know, I was going to ask you the, the the other thing about him in particular is that you know he's he's uh, he's now known as much for the cultivar Jack Hare, and people see that more than anything. Now, there's lots of 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 Chong related types of of buds in places, but there's not like a Tommy Chong bud yet. I don't right? think so. I don't think so. And I, I doubt if there ever will be, to tell you the truth. Why? You're in charge of that. How would you how well, would your bud be if it was you? You can do the magic wand and make it exactly the way you want it. What's the closest bud? You see with me, when they ask me to, you know, what's your favorite strain? Well, there's a biblical quote, and I believe it's part of the Ten Commandments. It's called Judge Not. Ah. And I, I'm a spiritualist. I, I study uh, Joel S. Goldsmith big time. Joel okay. S. Goldsmith. Yeah. Okay. And he's, he's, he never wrote any books. He's like Jesus. He never wrote anything. But people, his followers taped them and they wrote them down. He's a mystic. And he'll teach you the, 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 the secret, everything you need to know uh, uh, about the spiritual world, the physical world, mm -hmm. why we're here, uh, what's going on, you know, everything. And, and I've been in search of that all, all my life. And I realized because I, I'm, uh, uh, the way my childhood was, I, I realized that I, I was chosen, you know, I was yeah. picked out of, uh, and th this is my job. This is, this is what I was meant to do. And, and, and what I found out about when I, I discovered, I started reading about judging not. See, when you judge, you sometimes put the wrong label on the bottle. You know, you put the wrong label. You you come to a, a false assumption, and that's from judging. And 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 the Bible, or the or the sayings goes, you know, judge righteous judgment. In other words, if you can see what's going on, then okay, now you can go. Okay, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, but when you judge anything. You're you're seeing a, a very limited amount of in, of, of information, you know, okay. and, and and so rather than to make judgments and and like filing, like one of the jobs you get it when you join an office, you become a file clerk. What's a file clerk? Okay. Well, you 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 look at the titles and you put them in the right file. So when someone's looking for something, they can go to the right file. And they can they can pick it out, you see. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're when you're talking about uh, anything, because we're 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 not we're not stuck. We're uh, everything's moving mm -hmm. in, in our world. Everything's moving. You know, the Earth is moving. The sun's moving. Uh, we're, we're always we're on a journey. We're on a trip. You know. And, and and when things move, things change. And so what you judge one minute will be wrong the next minute mm -hmm. or vice versa. And so rather than to judge, behold. In other words, see it, see what it is. And rather than judging and saying, okay, well, that's what that is. And then moving on. Always leave your mind open for more information. And so rather than judging anything, reserve your judgment, you see, and then make righteous judgments. And that's with everything. Okay. That's with that. Thank everything. you. That last part was very important for me because, you know, I, I'm a judge at a lot of different cannabis cups. And I have two coming up here. I'm going to Amsterdam in about a month and a half. And I'm going, oh, shit, if I can't judge anything now, what am I going to do? But I'm going to tell you, this is an important part of this. When I saw you, I told you last time in, in Canada, you, I, I made up a really cool little picture that had all your album covers all around it. And you signed it for me and you gave me my command. 
it says smoke everything and it was one year after that i moved to amsterdam and it was during that next year that i wrote the connoisseur's guide to the amsterdam coffee shops and i went to every single coffee shop in amsterdam so i literally did what my master commanded me to do i smoked everything i, I love it i love it same as me you know they asked me when i said what, what what's your favorite strain i tell them i haven't found it yet yeah because that's what we're doing we're looking we're, we're, we're looking and it, everything depends on, on your state of mind at the time yeah you know one of the reasons i'm back to smoking little joints is because this is all i need you know everything else for publicity those big joints and, you know smoking and uh, all that now how i don't many, think smoke goes to waste because we got so much smoke how but many how many joints a day do you need. smoke it's really, it's really how many times a day do I smoke? Right. It's not so much joints. I'll smoke. I, 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 I used to collect, uh, I still do. <laughs> <laughs> These are my, my roaches. Do you re-roll them? No, no, no. I, I don't. I, I'm not really, I don't have the patience. It took yeah. me a, forever to learn how to roll a cigarette. You mm -hmm. know, back, back in my day, uh, you had roll your own. Mm -hmm. And there yeah. was, uh, what, what was that tobacco called? It was very, uh, Bull Durham. Bull okay. Durham tobacco came in a little package. And if you were a cool, like a cowboy, you're on your horse, you could roll with one hand. You, Absolutely. You'd think, open it, put the tobacco in the paper roll with one hand. But I... Um, what about yeah. micro? Mo, what about microdosing? Have you been, had a chance to do any microdosing? Have you found any that's really awesome? No. On the, mush, on the mushrooms? No, no, no. I, I did my psychedelics back in uh, early 70s. And I it. haven't been there. Yeah, you know, yeah. Ayahuasca and all that. No, I haven't, mm -hmm. haven't had to do it. I, the last time I took acid was with my wife. Well, this is why we're still together. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Okay. I, was, I was happily married and, and she was happily my girlfriend. And she was happily, she was happy to the fact that I was married yeah. because she was so beautiful, is so beautiful. Whenever she went out with anybody, uh, they would fall in love with her and they would become like, uh, you know, and, 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 and she said so independent that uh, when she met me, we had a great friendship and we loved each other, but I was married and so I couldn't put that on her and 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 she wanted to be she told her back in the day she told me her plan was to not not get married just be a kept woman <laughs> uh, be a mistress <laughs> and, and with a very rich person very sounds rich great person. yeah <laughs> her mother told her you can you can fall in love with a rich guy just as well as you can fall in love with a poor guy <laughs> <laughs> well but done got her wish she got her wish and we've been together now way over 50 years. Yeah, that's unreal, dude. And you guys are so happy. And I mean, I follow you on all the social medias and everything. And oh, good. It's wonderful to see. You know, the other thing that's wonderful to see was you guys jumping into NFTs. And yeah. you've got some fucking cool pictures, dude. And I've joined your Discord and I'm interacting with all your peoples in there. Do you have one of these NFTs that you already love more than the other or... Not, not yet, not yet. My son is more uh, Paris. He's he's more uh, in charge of that that part of it. Mm -hmm. I'm making NFTs. These these little guys that are that are making, they're they're all going to be NFTs. All my art, by the way, is not for me. It's mm -hmm. for when I leave, and then my my uh, 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 what do they call it? Your my estate, estate, kind sir. Yes. We'll 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 <laughs> put a price tag on it and everything. Dude, well, that'll be decades from now. That's all I can you know, tell it's you. You not that far. I'm, I'm not that far off. No, I, I uh, health-wise, I want to see. You know, I, I heard about this village in Russia mm -hmm. that uh, had the oldest people on, on the planet. Mm -hmm. And the reason they were around was that they lived on a hill, a mountain, and the only way they get the water was they had to go down to the 
to the water and it was down a mountain. Yeah. And so every day, they were, twice a day, maybe sometimes more, they had to walk up and down this mountain, carrying wood, carrying water. <laughs> they lived way into their past 100. I think mm -hmm. they get up to 120 or whatever. Wow. And so as long as I got my mountain. <laughs> yeah, you did. I'm, a mountain I'm of gonna, weed. Yeah, I'm going to stay, stay there. I, I want to, yeah, the, the weed again, you know, it, it really, it's, it's my, um, it's my reward. Mm -hmm. You know, the end of the day, I like this one little kid, he's walking by and he smelled the weed. And he said to his dad, mm, smells like bedtime. <laughs> uh, uh, my friends from Amsterdam uh, wanted me to ask you do you ever get good hash there and and do you smoke a lot of hash or do you smoke hash well no I that's Cheech's favorite thing by the way hash uh -huh. um, no unfortunately we don't I tried to make hash in fact I got a, a press downstairs that uh, but I, I'm not I'm not that uh, able to it. Um, no, I actually I, I we don't hash the weed the, the buds are so here. You know, mm -hmm. I mean hash. Think about hash is just take uh, mar uh, marijuana flower dust mm -hmm. and, and press it compress it together and, and then you got little things. Yeah. I, I, I'm surrounded by so much pot now. One quick follow-up question. I know that you're very careful about not smoking or, or you're COVID conscious about things. And you, yeah. were, you were conscious about this beforehand. And I was thinking about this. I mean, Tommy Chong has been offered joints regularly after shows since 1971, right? Or whatever. What yeah. point did you say I'm? No, I'm okay. I'm good. And well, you got to be careful. Uh, I do anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, because you don't know what's in in anything. You know. And so the first time anybody gave me a joint, I didn't smoke it. I put it in my pocket. We smoked his. <laughs> <laughs> and he lit one up. And then by the, then I realized that the first time. And I've always been that cautious, you know. Yeah. My mother, growing up in the country and stuff like that, you know, you don't just, in fact, you're very careful what you eat, <laughs> you know, what you put in your mouth. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, my master. Thank my you. pleasure, my friend. I appreciate it so much. And uh, I hope you get a chance to uh, uh, keep watching some of our episodes. I follow everything that you're doing. And we sure I will. Still you are you are my closing on every single video that i do and uh, i thank you for that and uh, uh again uh, uh, i'm i'm at your disposal my master thank you when we uh you know us potheads you know we're, we're like uh, alzheimer's patients you know yeah uh, we're always meeting new people because we can't remember anything <laughs> <laughs> is that a picture behind you yeah no this is this is my home <laughs> yeah no it's a background just a background oh, I that i have it. i, I love, love it too it. it's perfect i want this one i want to get buried right here under this light <laughs> yeah i got i got some film of me i i I'm, i guess i'll figure out how to how to do one of those too that's well, great okay thank you take care my friend thank you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. <laughs> wow how was that guys hanging out with tommy freaking chong I am in heaven. I'm just going to stay here in my little cosmic world here and just smile. That's all I'm going to do is just smile. Just sit here and enjoy everything for a while. Listen, I love you all. I will see you on Wednesday with a brand new Wake and Bake with Captain Hooter. Let us just go off and enjoy the light. Bye, everyone. See you next time.
It's Captain Hooter. Far out, man.